So obviously this is not a lot of time to present. I wanted to quickly um, give an overview of some of the, the big questions that are unresolved that, are, that I think are in this human building interaction space. My lab is actually called human building interaction lab. Um, and I'll give a few examples of some of the studies we've done. Um, so I think one of the big questions is where should we aim for on this, uh, for, for buildings, where should we aim from fully manual to fully automated? And I think if you ask the computer scientists, uh, they say fully automated. And if you ask me, maybe the architects, I don't want to generalize, they'll say, you know, go fully manual. Uh, and I, I suspect the answer is somewhere in between, but it's not as trivial as it might appear. Um, and there's a lot of science that says, for example, we should not go fully automated uh, because just giving people a perception of control um, allows them to tolerate a wider range of conditions, which is very good for, for energy use. So I think it's, it's really not trivial, and I, I see a little bit too much trend towards fully automation um, without the recognition that there's some psychological aspects and so on uh, that, that really muddy the waters. Um, here's a study that uh, I really like uh, from Finland, did it, it just highlights some of these issues. So um, this researcher did a survey of 1,300 people, I think, and he asked them um, in which type of space, or what's your satisfaction with room temperature in various space types, and there's a clear trend. So satisfaction is significantly higher in single family houses compared to open plan offices. And some of the reasons are obvious, like you can adjust your clothing level at home a little bit more. Um, I think that's been in the news lately, that uh, dress uh, codes in, in corporate places really affect comfort. Um, but the most interesting conclusion he drew from this is that uh, people in offices don't understand the HVAC systems very well, so they have less perceived control. At homes you can kind of see, whereas is in office buildings it's very much behind the the walls and the ceiling, and you just, just don't know how the system is working. So here's a nice example that sort of sums up this conflict between occupants and operators. So it's a case where operators don't trust the occupants because occupants waste energy. Um, but then the, op the occupants overcame this by putting freezies here and tricking, <laughs> tricking the building. <laughs> how do we... Uh, Go from research to code, I think right now there's a little bit of a problem. So this is a study uh, looking at optimal lighting levels in offices, and the range is really big. So from 100 lux to 800 lux, this is what people said they prefer. And I think code committees tend to take this and say, okay, how are we gonna keep at least the majority happy? Okay, maybe we'll, you know, we'll figure out what lighting levels will keep 90% of people happy. But really the interpretation here should be that the, the preferences are broad and we need to give control to people rather than try to pick one value that will satisfy a lot of people. Another big question for me is how do these different forms of IEQ relate? So indoor air quality, thermal comfort, visual comfort, and acoustic comfort. So there's some physiological aspects in that our tolerance for um, Warmth might be higher if conditions are dark, like in here. Uh, but there's also a lot of design-related questions. So for example, if you're trying to resolve a noisy room, um, you might put in carpets, uh, but the carpets are gonna collect dust, and so that has IAQ implications. The, the carpets might off-gas. Um, VOCs also has IAQ implications. It might affect the reflectances of the room, that has visual comfort implications, and so on. So, Many researchers look at one aspect, but I think uh, we need to broaden our horizon. And then with well, we've got all these different aspects um, of wellness that I think also play a big role. And I, I won't claim to really be an expert in that. I'm, I'm an engineer. Um, another thing I think we need to do is change our way of thinking. So if you're familiar with robust design, this is kind of a P diagram that says, um, here's the building, there's the occupants. The occupants are a source of noise for performance. Um, and, I mean, we laugh, but this is pretty much how all modeling is done for code compliance. We, we, we treat occupants as a schedule. They're either there or they're not, and they produce heat, moisture, CO2, uh, and that's about their only function in the building, as far as the, the model is concerned. Uh, but instead, I think we need to understand that there's a two-way interaction. 
and that so many subtleties affect this two-way interaction um, and, and trigger behaviors and so on. Um, and I'll, I'll get into more detail on this in a minute. So this is sort of a, a framework I'm working with in my research right now. And it's, it's quite common in human factors textbooks, but I think it hasn't really entered the building community too much, building research community. Um, so what we have here is the interaction between people and buildings involves some human input, um, and that input usually happens to an interface, which might be physical or it might be uh, something like a microphone. Um, and then that interface has some context, which is really important. There's some logic between the interface and the actuator, like lighting or heating or cooling. Um, the actuator also has context, like how many people does it affect? Uh, so for lighting, uh, if, the, if someone turns on a light, does that affect a lot of people in a large area? And finally, there's feedback. And I think in modern buildings, we're missing a lot of these pieces. Um, so if, I, if we look at lighting, um, there's a light switch. The logic in this case is very easy. Light, changes, or light switch turns on or off. Light turns on or off. And there's feedback. So there's uh, feedback in that the person switching can feel that. And they can also see the light, ideally. Um, but in a lot of buildings, you can't see which lights you're turning on, um, and there generally isn't that feedback, especially for heating and cooling where it takes a long time to react. So I think in the olden days when we lit a fire, if we were um, cold, it's very easy to understand the physics of that or open a window and bring in a, a breeze. That's not really the case for a lot of modern mechanical systems, and I think that's a big problem. And as we centralize our HVAC, uh, it becomes a bigger problem because what you're controlling happens further and further away from where you are. So I'll just give a few examples from my research. Um, we did a field study in offices, and one of the things we found that was kind of weird is that a lot of people had covered the motion sensor. And we didn't know why. Um, and one of the things I've realized as I move along in my research is that you've got to talk to people. Not something we typically do in engineering, I think. But, uh, <laughs> but the reason they were doing this is because they didn't like the lights were turning on automatically when they walked into their offices. This was actually a really nicely daylit space, and it's a pity that the controls basically uh, didn't acknowledge that there was good daylight in this space. Um, so my PhD student realized that so this is the sort of light switch we had. You could pull off a, a lid or a, a cover. Um, flip a few dip switches, and you can change how the controls work. Uh, and in this case, without going into too much detail, we discovered that from automatic on lights, where the, the lights triggered on automatically with motion, to manual on, in other words, the occupant actually had to turn on the lights, uh, we saved 95% energy. Uh, which is shocking because, you know, the whole lighting industry is boasting about LEDs and things like that that might save 50 percentage, but 95 percent just from a little subtle change. Um, one of the things I've been working on lately is um, new ways of doing post-occupancy evaluations, and this actually kind of relates to the previous presentation. So, um, what I wanted to do is give uh, participants in a post-occupancy evaluation a way to um, take pictures of their environment because. With post-occupancy evaluations, sometimes you get lost in the data. You don't really know what the person's experiencing because they're just answering some Likert scale questions and things like that. Um, so this was a smartphone survey where people had to take a picture of various features of buildings um, as they were instructed, mainly interfaces. Uh, and then I tried to take a sort of qualitative, quantitative approach to analyzing the data. And so what we're looking at is uh, a graph relating what they said the, the availability of window shading devices was uh, in terms of how far they are away from their desk uh, to their ability to um, decrease daylight. And generally there was a trend, but the nice thing about the photos is we can start to figure out, okay, if there's an outlier, like what, what's the issue? Um, so for example, this person could theoretically reach their shade from, uh, from standing up. The problem was they had to reach around the monitors, and so they said there wasn't that good a level of control, even though theoretically the distance is not that far. Uh, and we found something a bit different for lighting. Uh, I don't want to go into the details because I 
got five minutes left. Um, but we found that it's a, it's a bit more complex with lighting because if you're far away from your light switch, it probably also means you're in a shared space, um, which means that there's kind of social considerations. I think another issue is that we've become addicted with being told how long till we, we get something. We're very spoiled. Um, <laughs> And this isn't really happening in buildings, and so if you adjust the thermostat, for instance, you don't know if it's working, how long it's going to take, etc. Um, so I've been really lucky at Carleton. We work with facilities, and we've been able to largely change the way sensors are installed and controls are happening. Um, and I have this sort of living lab, which is a building with lots of professors and staff in it. Um, and one of the things we're doing is looking at um, interaction with the thermostat, and we're trying to predict what, or we're trying to see if we could have predicted how long it would take for the space to adjust. Um, and so far, it's going okay. Uh, but our goal is to be able to tell people after they change the thermostat how long it's going to take to reach the set point. Um, in many cases, we found that this is a very discouragingly long time. <laughs> like after they'll go home. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing we've done is try to collect data in sort of innovative ways in spaces um, that are a little less traditional. So in a gym, um, we put up these devices that let people put a five point, uh, there's a five point scale and they can evaluate indoor air quality and thermal comfort. Um, and it's mainly children, uh, are sort of pre-teens. Um, and what we wanted to do is concurrently measure subjective evaluations with measurement uh, measured sort of traditional temperature, relative humidity, all those boring things. Uh, I'm just kidding. And uh, so this is how we started to look at the data. And we, for every button push, there's a dot on the psychrometric chart. And so we can start to see what are the preferred conditions. The range, this didn't work out that well. The range between the kind of too cold and too hot was like one degree Celsius. Um, so I guess that means the space is relatively comfortable. Another thing we're looking at is text mining of um, uh, work order logs and complaints from occupants. And this has been kind of interesting because you can start to quantify what are the recurring problems. And you can even look at what are the physical things that led to that complaint. For example, was it really cold before they called? How long were they subjected to cold conditions and so on? So I'm just going to conclude by mentioning a project I'm co-leading. So this is IEA EBC Annex 79. It's called Occupant Centric Building Design and Operation. If you're not familiar with IEA EBC, it's so it's it's under the IEA, the International Energy Agency, and then within that there's the Energy and Buildings and Communities. And this is one of well, 79 projects, but actually there's only about 10 at any given time. Um, and we meet every six months and try to answer big questions, and uh, it's fantastic. So there's lots of countries involved. There is our meeting in uh, Ottawa, and if you're interested in being on the mailing list, I'd be happy to add you. Just come see me or email me. Um, and we have a, a website, but if you Google Annex 79, you'll find it. And some of the key things we're looking at is how do we deal with these multiple aspects of IEQ in the context of behavior and energy, um, what are the new data sources that we can start to exploit, and what are the privacy and ethics considerations of those? Um, what are some occupant-centric building design methods? Um, and one of the things we're looking at is generative design with, with Asim here. Um, what is occupant-centric control, and how do we start to codify some of these findings uh, into the building codes? Because right now it's very simple. And I think uh, fairly outdated. So in closing, I, I continue to show this slide, but I, I would argue, and I think this room somewhat fills the void, we have our building engineering, our architectural engineering people, and we have the human factors people, and there's a big void in the middle. Um, and I'm really happy to see everyone in here helping to fill that void. Thank you. Sure.